Well, good morning and welcome everyone. On behalf of the TDJ group, I'd like to introduce a special guest speaker, Mr. Michael Carney of Jay Carpenter Environmental. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, James. Um, our format's a little, uh, little different this morning. As I'd said, we're going to be introducing uh, Mike Carney here and he's going to talk about a specialized uh, topic titled lead management for fire and range facilities. So we think you guys are gonna be particularly interested in being able to learn what Mike has been able to learn just about applying our product to those kinds of facilities that generates very, generate various kinds of waste. But before we jump into the presentation, just a little background on uh, Mike. He is a professional engineer. He's got over 35 years of experience including 30 as a consultant and uh, going on his eighth year for Jay Carpenter Environmental. So please uh, welcome everyone, um, Mike Carney of Jay Carpenter Environmental. Morning, Mike. All right, thank you, James. You I bet. appreciate it. James, uh, I, I am a professional geologist, not an engineer. So, um, but I worked with engineers a lot in my life. So I just thought I'd clarify that. Um, anyway, thank you. And welcome everybody. Uh, thank you to TDJ for giving me the opportunity to talk to you folks a little bit about firing range facilities and how you can manage lead at the facilities. Uh, I'm with Jay Carpenter Environmental. We're a distributor of environmental products and equipment, including remediation products. We're the sole distributor of the remediation app, uh, of TDJ heavy metal stabilization products for remediation applications. Before I get going into my uh, presentation here, I just wanted to point out this uh, third slide here, which are uh, references uh, that uh, were, were part of the uh, in, uh, information that I used to uh, prepare this presentation. I think there's some good resources here for you. Uh, Corps of Engineers, EPA, Department of Energy, uh, some technical presentations. And this uh, presentation will be posted on the TDJ website, so it will be available for you. So this list of references will be as well. A summary of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, first, we'll talk about lead, its use, toxicity, and exposure. And then we'll jump into active firing range, some attributes of active firing ranges uh, that uh, relate to the accumulation of lead, including shot fall, bullet containment, uh, reclamation, removal and recycling of lead, <clears throat> and some lead management strategies uh, for the active facilities. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about closed sites, how to assess and remediate those and uh, some strategies for doing so. We'll start off here then talking about lead. Lead is a uh, dense, cost-effective uh, uh, material that's used for uh, ammunition, a mineral used for ammunition. It provides um, excellent ammunition because of its density. The density of lead provides sufficient mass necessary for effective transfer of kinetic energy to the target. I'm sure we've all heard about the, some of the uh, harmful health effects of lead, including uh, the, uh, what's listed here, uh, brain develop uh, impacts on uh, brain development, nervous system, kidney damage, uh, seizures, unconsciousness, and ultimately potential death. So it certainly uh, would be considered, lead would be considered a potential contaminant of concern at a firing range. So uh, let's look at some of the exposure pathways at firing ranges uh, for this potential contaminant of concern. Uh, air, soil, and surface groundwater would be the primary pathways. Air through inhalation, uh, potentially at maintenance, uh, in, in maintenance areas uh, where there's any sweeping or raking. Uh, also, uh, the potential for exposure to residue at the firing location. Soil, uh, the direct contact um of soil uh is a potential uh exposure pathway as well as the uh, potential for ingestion uh, such as with waterfowl and then thirdly surface groundwater uh, exposure through physical transport of the bullets and particles via stormwater off the property off the site or also um further uh transport the fate and transport of the uh of the uh 
uh, dissolved lead into storm and groundwater. The applicable regulations are RECRA and the Clean Water Act that were enacted in the 1970s. The solid and hazardous waste regulations apply under RECRA. And then the regulator, regulation of water discharges are under the Clean Water Act. And for point discharges, the National Pollutant um, uh, uh, the NPDES permits, pardon me, <laughs> National Pollutant uh, Elimination System. The uh, factors influencing physical transport of lead include uh, topography, channel width, precipitation intensity, soil type, and vegetative cover. The uh, topography on a site, uh, if there are steep slopes, that can increase the carrying capacity of water. So again, we're looking at the physical transport of lead. How can it be transported on a site? Just to be aware of it. <clears throat> the channel width, if there are any channels, you really don't want to have any channels on your site. But um, if you do, they should be engineered. And uh, the channel width will certainly control the velocity of the water and therefore the carrying capacity of the water. Precipitation intensity, uh, that would depend on what uh, geography you're in, what climate you're in and whether or not you have uh, surges of precipitation that can uh, potentially cause transport of lead offsite, the uh, lead particles and bullets offsite. The soil type, clay has a lower permeability, uh, which is good for the potential migration to groundwater. Uh, however, with the lower permeability, you will have uh, the retention of water during high precipitation events and potential for sheet flow in an increased carrying capacity of the physical lead itself. Uh, sand, you will have infiltration and the potential uh, for um, uh, migration to groundwater. Uh, however, um, you won't have the uh, ponding of water, you won't have as much sheet flow, obviously. And then finally, vegetative cover can inhibit the uh, velocity of uh, sheet flow. Uh, during precipitation events. And also it can <coughs> assist with adsorption of lead. The weathering products of lead bullets include lead carbonate and lead uh, sulfate, uh, uh, less so anglicite, which is the lead sulfate, uh, more typically the sericite or the hydrocericite. Factors that influence the dissolution of lead include the precipitation rate, the pH, contact time, exposure to the water, and uh, the presence of organic material, as just discussed with the uh, potential for um, uh, 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 the um, adsorption of, of lead and uh, taking it out of uh, the potential for being soluble. Uh, stepping back there a little with the pH, uh, the lead, uh, as with uh, many of the transition metals, is amphoteric, meaning that it is it has it has the capacity to act as both a base and an acid, uh, thereby uh, it increased solubility of lead at higher and lower pHs, higher basic uh, uh, chemistry and uh, a lower pH acidic environment. We're gonna switch gears now a little bit uh, from talking about lead and we're just gonna talk about some of the components uh, of uh, active firing ranges. And the, the purpose here is just to talk about where the lead might accumulate on a property. The uh, ammunition range um, and uh, penetration rate of, of bullets on, um, the, uh, uh, on the materials that are used for a backstop uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about shot fall, bullet containment, and reclamation. <clears throat> this is a, uh, it's not very legible, I realize that, but this is just a uh, maximum range of small arms am ammunition. Uh, you see that um, the uh, 12 gauge uh, uh, shot would be a quarter to a half mile. That would be applicable in a skeet, uh, trap skeet, or a sport clay uh, application. Um, and then getting into uh, pistol and rifle range, uh, 22 would uh, 
is, is would be about a mile, and then a 44 mag would be up to a mile and a half, for example. And then this chart here just shows the uh, cal a, a relationship of caliber, uh, bullet caliber, and thickness required to stop the penetration. And just looking at the uh, that uh, column on the right there, the uh, for the 50 caliber, uh, for example, concrete uh, would have a penetration depth of 12 inches for a 50 caliber bullet. Uh, dry sand, two and a half feet, and then an earthen berm, five to six feet. Shot fall is the area of lead accumulation in a firing range. In a trap, skeet, or sporting clay environment, this is very important to uh, consider because this is where the lead is going to accumulate for future reclamation and uh, potential remediation. The, uh, ideally, what you want to do is you want to try to reduce that area of shot fall. And one way here uh, depicted on this slide is just to uh, adjust the angle from your firing locations to reduce that area of shot fall. Again, this is just another schematic showing the uh, area of for a skeet range layout and how that shot fall um, area would be depicted. Looking at bullet containment, uh, some of the materials that are used to contain bullets include earthen burns, uh, where the height and slope is important. And then uh, also the material, uh, whether it's a sand or a clay, earthen berm. Uh, one thing that's uh, interesting, I think, is that uh, with a clay berm, you do have the potential, if you have a uh, high water table, say, um, you can have uh, capillary uh, forces allow for retention of uh, water up into that earthen berm, increasing the contact time and potential for dissolution. One way to address that capillarity is to put a gravel or a coarse layer at the base of the um, of your berm uh, to uh, cut that cut that capillarity off and remove that as a potential uh, exposure pathway for the uh, for the water. Sand uh, is is uh, useful for berm material because it's easier to reclaim uh, with for um, using screening techniques. Steel and concrete, um, those are uh, useful, except you need to uh, be aware of the potential for ricochet with those. And then also rubber uh, for dissipating that uh, kinetic energy is useful, but there is, uh, with the heat generated, there is a potential for melting. Here's just a, this is very, this is a very clear picture. It's just a, a schematic, just showing a, a rifle range. Uh, where you've got the targets and then the uh, impact uh, berm in the distance. These are just some other uh, uh, bullet collection devices for smaller facilities. Deflection plate with a vertical swirl trap uh, deflects it uh, perpendicularly to the firing direction into a swirl trap and then just drops it into a bucket. Um, another, uh, uh, this is just a depiction of a sand berm. Uh, where the bullets are impacted in the sand beyond the target. This is a depiction of a granulated rubber um, uh, uh, backstop uh, with a uh, elastic facing, which will absorb the granulated rubber will absorb that kinetic energy, and then the uh, the um, the bullets will drop down and uh, be. Uh, uh, accessed in the uh, in the lower portion there of that picture. Another uh, sample of a deflector plate here, uh, where it uses the both deflection and um, uh, gravity to uh, to collect the uh, to, to capture the bullets. This is a uh, depiction of uh, some lamella strips that are hung in a herringbone pattern, again, to dissipate the energy and uh, allow for collection of the bullets. And then finally here, uh, this is just a deflection steel plate into a sand uh, collection area um, for uh, future screening to, for removal of the bullets.
Now I'm going to uh, step away from the uh, active ranges. We're going to come back and look at operational characteristics of the firing ranges. But before we do that, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the regulations. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and read this just because I think it's, uh, it's better than paraphrasing it. EPA's Office of Solid Waste issued guidance in 1997 indicating that lead shot, when recycled, is considered a scrap metal and is therefore exempt from record regulation. Under the record subtitle C, lead shot would be considered scrap metal, which is exempt from hazardous waste regulation. So it's kind of redundant there, but uh, um, it's, 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 it's uh, good news. To ensure that lead is not considered discarded or abandoned on your range within the meaning of the record status, i.e. not hazardous, you need to conduct periodic lead removal activities uh, they should be planned for um, and conducted accordingly. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, during the reclamation activities, the this uh, 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 RECRA subtitle C military munitions rule uh, indicated that the range manager, the rule considers range manager to be a necessary part of the safe use of munitions for their intended purpose. Thus, the recovery of lead shot and bullets is an intrinsic part of the range operation. Therefore, there's an exclusion from the subtitle C, hazardous waste regs, including, this is important, including the placement of soil back on the range. So when you place the soil back on the range after your reclamation activities, that is not considered, that is part of your operations and that's all, that's, that's fine, as long as that you're continuing to operate. So now let's look at some of the operational considerations for reclamation. Lead volume, tracking the, uh, you want to track that to correspond with your reclamation schedule. The size of the shot of the bullets, that's something to be aware of uh, so that you can accommodate with the appropriate screen sizes when screening. The shooting direction, the pad in the shot fall, we talked about that, that that's where you target your reclamation. Looking at your operation schedule and your range life, for your reclaim schedule. This is a list of just some examples of reclamation frequency. It could be based on the square footage of backstop and the amount of lead, uh, the number of rounds, the number of targets that are used, um, or you can just base it on how much lead is accumulating on, uh, you know, in, in that last bullet there, it's uh, two pounds of lead per square foot have accumulated. Thus, that's the, that's the criteria to use for uh, reclamation. Either way, it's something that you want to uh, consider um, so that you are consistent with your reclamation. But then also, uh, when you're considering your uh, reclamation schedule, you want to be able to perform it that's appropriate in a, at a frequency that's appropriate for your site. And that would include uh, uh, consideration of the number of rounds fired, uh, soil pH, your annual precipitation, the soil type and depth of groundwater, some of the characteristics of your site. <clears throat> lead removal can be uh, conducted by hand raking and sifting at smaller sites using a two, me uh, two, two screen system there, um, or you can use mechanized screening equipment, again, with two screen systems typically. Vacuuming can be used to vacuum up uh, the uh, area of lead accum accumulation and then taking that material off to another area for screening. Or one thing that's been done with vacuums as well is to, to uh, adjust the vacuum such that the denser material uh, remains and the vacuum only collects the, uh, the uh, non-lead, uh, uh, um, the, uh, the denser lead uh, is left behind and you just vacuum up the uh, less dense material. A more expensive uh, mechanism of lead material, lead removal, uh, but it can be effective is soil washing with wet screening, gravity, and pneumatic methods. Lead recycling can provide a significant cost relief to lead removal activities, and most most operators of firing ranges are, are well aware of this, and there are many professional uh, uh, lead reclamation companies. Uh, that provide services 
and they will adjust uh, just just as a salvage company uh, will uh, adjust their cost for demolition based on the amount of scrap that's available on a property. Uh, similarly, um, the, your reclamation costs can be adjusted based on how much uh, reclaimable lead um, uh, is uh, uh, the, the recycler is able to uh, uh, collect during the reclamation. And again, uh, the professional lead reclamation companies are out there, there's many of them. <clears throat> a summary of a, the key firing range characteristics then. The range size, the sh shot fall area and target co configuration, the soil top type, sand versus clay and your burn construction, for your burn construction. Uh, your topography, uh, just be aware of your stormwater velocity and the potential uh, for the carrying capacity of that water to, to move that lead off site. Ideally, you don't want that to happen, obviously. Uh, precipitation, the, the uh, intensity of, of precipitation and the amount of precipitation that occurs. The groundwater, surface water depth and, uh, and the proximity of any surface water. Depth of groundwater and the proximity to surface water. Uh, the, uh, uh, the vegetation to reduce runoff velocity. And then also consider the accessibility of your uh, lead accumulation area to reclamation. Now, finally, for the uh, active facilities, uh, looking at uh, general strategies for lead management. You want to reduce your shot fall area, especially for trap, skeet, and clay, where is where would that would apply. Uh, adjust your pH of soil as needed. Um, uh, adjustment of the pH, for example, using something like lime, that's that's not really a stable long-term solution uh, because it's reversible. Uh, we would recommend uh, addition of a stabilization agent to the soil that you put back after you reclaim the lead. So what you can do is you can actually maintain a, um, a, a, a uh, low potential for leachability of, uh, of lead from your property while it's operating. <clears throat> Obviously, once, it's, once you close your, your, uh, your, the firing range, then it does need to be addressed, any, any uh, leachable lead on the property, any uh, potential hazardous waste needs to be addressed. You can uh, control the amount of uh, hazardous waste that is generated over time your, at your operating facility by entering a stabiliz stabilization agent like the TDJ product, like Blastox, uh, which will, it, it's really a, a, a three-pronged approach. It'll make a, a pH adjustment to inhibit the leachability of the lead. And then it would also have a posilonic effect encapsulating, um, uh, providing encapsulation, uh, reducing the exposure to, uh, to uh, the leaching liquids, water. And then um, also there is a transition from the sericite to a less uh, soluble lead silicate. So th that three-pronged approach really provides a long-term stable solution for um, uh, stabilizing the lead on a, on a property. Soil placement considerations include uh, reducing permeability uh, and enhancing runoff capacity. Uh, clay is difficult for bullet shot removal. Lead will adsorb the clay, which uh, can be a good thing reducing the potential for uh, leaching. And then uh, sand allows easier bullet shot reclamation. So it's probably a combination. You've got some uh, positive and negatives with each, with each of those. Finally, I, I want to just talk about the assessment and remediation of closed sites. Uh, whatever you've got depicted here is a decision matrix. And uh, these decision matrices can be uh, as complex as they, as they need to be. Sometimes they can be more complex than they need to be, certainly. Um, but it's kind of a good uh, framework to, to take a look at um, uh, assessing and remediating a closed site. And, and some of the considerations that you want to have when you, when, you, uh, when you look at a closed site is uh, what's the vertical and horizontal degree and extent of lead and other COCs on the property? That's, that, that goes without saying. Uh, but with some of this background, you have an idea of where the lead might be. Where, 
that was the shot full area. Where were the berms over time? Where, uh, uh, how long has it been in operation? Um, when the fire, firing locations moved over time? Uh, th those are the kinds of questions that you can ask. And then also look at the environmental media that was impacted potentially, soil, surface water, groundwater, sediment. Are impacted areas limited to locations where the bullets and shot were initially deposited or has there been any migration? Um, and then what are the existing or potential human or environmental exposure pathways? The, these are just some, some of the considerations and certainly what the ultimate land use is uh, for the property after it's closed. <coughs> Remediation of closed sites includes soil stabilization. I talked about the blast ox product. Uh, that is probably the most common and uh, most effective way uh, to manage uh, the uh, impacted uh, uh, lead soil uh, so, and render it non-hazardous. The uh, soil washing, uh, again, that's another uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, vitrification, which involves heat, um, and then also uh, chemical extraction. These other three are uh, uh, typically more expensive and more elaborate. Uh, um, uh, me me mechanisms to uh, remediate closed sites. And then finally, uh, just two takeaways uh, for this presentation would be that effective lead management at active firing ranges can reduce the potential remediation costs while providing compensation for recycled lead. Uh, if, you, if you manage it properly and, the, and you are able to target where your lead is accumulating, uh, and you look at uh, um, an effective means to remove the lead, you're going to, uh, uh, you're going to be uh, uh, happy with your operation, you're going to get the recovery of the cost, and you're also going to uh, uh, reduce the potential for remediation when that site's closed out. When you are looking at closed sites, you need to include consideration of operating conditions at the firing range when active. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for sitting in on this. I will send a follow-up email to all of you um, and uh, just letting, uh, uh, again, thanking you again. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, James Lively and uh, Evan Bruton um, who uh, helped put this thing together for TDJ and um, have a great rest of the day and have a Merry Christmas. James, I'd like to uh, transfer over to James. James has some other uh, logistical things he wants to share with you. Well, thank you, Mike. Well done on that. I picked up a couple pieces of information myself while listening to that, Mike. So thank you for that. Um, I failed earlier to mention some housekeeping um, measures. We do want wanted to encourage you guys to submit any questions that you might have. Um, there is a dialogue box probably in your upper right hand section. Um, that as of right now, we don't have any specific questions that were mentioned there. Um, while people are online here, I do wanna go ahead and encourage you, if you do have a specific question um, that you would like to submit uh, publicly so that we can answer it publicly, feel free to do that. If you've got a specific question that's more germane to a specific project or a facility that you're managing, and you don't want this to be you know, publicly addressed, um, just shoot uh, Evan Bruton. Uh, that's the email that you had gotten the invitation on. If it's a specific private question, shoot that to Evan, and then we'll have Mike uh, respond back to that directly to you. Um, and as we're just going through here, I, I do see a couple of questions. The first question that was popped up was asked if, if you could receive a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. And the answer, of course, is absolutely. We'd love to be able to send you a, uh, a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation. So we've got your contact information. Um, if anybody else would like a copy of that, you know, make sure you go ahead and request that. The one question I did want to ask you, Mike, I know you've had some experience with our product. Could you give the audience just a overview or Kind of a range of pro of ad rates when you looked at the blast stocks 215 for the firing range waste management what's been your experience on the ad rate that was necessary to bring the the lead under tcop value yeah james I, you know typically obviously um uh, for anybody that's worked with soil that's uh you know the, uh, 
soils are uh, mostly heterogeneous and uh, and they are they're not all they're not certainly not all the same. But we have had consistent um, uh, results with the blast ox. And typically, if you've got um, uh, TCLP values in the uh, 50, uh, 5 to 50 milligram per liter range, you're looking at a 2 to 3% ad rate will drop it down to a no detect. And that's a no detect down to at the like 0.05 uh, milligram per liter. Um, and then as you get up into the 50 to 100 or even higher than that, certainly, um, we've had a lot of uh, success going up to about 4 or 5%. So typically, that's really uh, that's what we've seen as far as ad rates, James. Okay. And if, uh, thank you for addressing that, Mike. Uh, it does look like we have another question that was submitted, and, and feel free to continue submitting. We've got a little bit of time here. We're happy to answer the questions. And the specific question was: Have you ever used cation exchange capacity or CEC data during your assessment? Um, and I would just like to, to add to that on the blast ox material, as was mentioned earlier, it's a calcium silicate and it actually works through chemical substitution reactions where you're going to form a heavy metal insoluble silicate in this case, as well as having a pH adjustment that's temporary, but does help in the overall scheme of things. And then finally, you do have a micro encapsulation effect. Uh, with the blast ox chemistry as well. And that uh, that does appear to be the last question that was submitted here. So again, Mike, thank you very much. Appreciate Thanks, you. Job well done. Uh, on behalf of the TDJ group at Jay Carpenter Environmental, please keep your eyes open in your inbox from an email, probably from Evan Bruton, as we're going to continue these uh, guest speaking educational webinars and just providing more information about waste management at various of these facilities. Uh, thank you again for your participation and please enjoy the rest of your day.